Good evening, welcome. We're so glad to have you here this evening. Uh, my name is Mola May, and I'm the director of Aspen Words, and this is Adrian Brodeur. And uh, we're delighted to see her this evening. It's been a while. I know. So I'm happy to see your face. Um, Winter Words could not happen without a lot of generous support, so I want to thank them very quickly. Our season pre presenting sponsors are Beth and Josh Mondry and Helen and Wally Obermeyer. I want to thank them. Thank you, guys. We also have uh, our grantors, sponsors, and media partners, the City of Aspen, La Dames de Aspen, the Thrift Shop of Aspen, the Aspen Times, Aspen Public Radio, and Coldwell Banker Mason Morse. And a special thanks to Isberian Rug Company, the Aspen Skiing Company, the Gantt for Housing, Adam ton uh, tonight, and uh, Linda and Denny Vaughn for hosting our National Council Dinner. A uh, few reminders, thank you, yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. We're very grateful to our sponsors. Um, we have a lot of cool things coming up. Uh, please join us for the book launch of Mark Tompkins' debut novel, <laughs> The Last Days of Magic, which is getting awesome reviews out there. Um, the event will take place at Explore at 5.30 on March 3rd. And uh, it'll include wine and food, and Mark will talk a little bit about this process. So, and Adrian, you're going to be back for that, too. I'm going to be back for that. Yeah. And our next Winter Words event is on March 15th, featuring the couple whom each have won a Pulitzer Prize, Geraldine Brooks and Tony Horwitz. How many, how many couples? <laughs> it's astounding. They're going to be great. And I uh, just want to let you know we have begun selling special pre-sale tickets to our summer benefit featuring Dr. Lucy Kalanithi on June 22nd. Her husband wrote the New York Times best-selling book, When Breath Becomes Air, and I just checked today, it is number one on the New York Times bestseller list. For four weeks For now. four weeks running. Um, and it, I read it uh, last week, and it, it changes the way you maneuver through your life. It's extraordinary. Um, so finally, happy Valentine's almost day. <laughs> We do have a handmade Valentine's in the lobby by our dear AW staff member, Nicole Stanton. Um, For those if of you, you who forgot. If you <laughs> forgot and uh, you need to get a Valentine to your love, uh, make a little donation to us and you'll make your love very happy. Yes, they are all handmade with beautiful poems. Yes. So. I'm going to turn it over to you, Adrian. Okay. Well, it's wonderful to be here. I haven't been here since Summer Word, so I'm very happy to be back. And even though I'm from New York, where I would say we have fairly abundant opportunities for entertainment, I will say that whenever I come to Aspen, I am always struck by the sheer volume of choices you have on any given night. So I did a little research, and my research tells me that tonight you could be at the Aspen Santa Fe Ballet, which is supposed to be a fantastic show, at the Lighted Up Blue Benefit, which is in the service of an extraordinary cause, at the Belly Up, listening to some uber cool band. Um, you could be pre-gaming for what no doubt will be some entertaining back and forth between Trump and Cruz. Um, but instead, you are here. So thank you. You are here to celebrate literature and stories and words and this fabulous author, Adam Johnson. And I just want to say thank you for being here. Um, thank you. So it is my enormous pleasure to introduce Adam Johnson to you tonight. I first met Adam about 15 years ago when I was a reader for the New York Public Library's Young Lions um, Fiction Award, and Adam's first collection, Emporium, was one of the five finalists. I think we have both since aged out of that group. <laughs> no more Young Lions. Um, and although Emporium did not win that particular contest, it went on to win many awards and really, you know, put his name in the sort of literary circles in New York, and everyone was watching him. So since then, Adam has gone on to write two novels and another collection, and he's won just about every major literary prize under the sun, including the Whiting Award, an NEA Fellowship, 
the Pulitzer Prize and the Dayton Literary Prize for his stunning novel, The Orphan Master's Son, and most recently, the National Book Award for this amazing collection of short stories called Fortune Smiles, which is also up for the Story Prize. And someone in the audience um, asked me up front about how to describe Adam's work, which of course is so hard, because it's kind of a little bit like looking right into the sun. It is that bright and intense and just, you know, fantastically hot um, and fierce. And Adam tends to gra gravitate as a writer towards these places where it's really hard to be fully human. And whether that's a physical place like North Korea or a technological place like holograms, just know as a reader to be warned, these strange surroundings and places and characters and predicaments will stay with you for long after you stop reading. Now, I need your help in giving Adam an extra, extra warm welcome um, because he got up at the crack of dawn this morning. I think we take for granted that everyone loves coming to Aspen and everyone does, but what had started as a conversation that was gonna bring his family out here for a four-day ski trip for a variety of reasons has turned into this wonderful person flying in on this 24-hour, you know, in-out trek on Valentine's Day weekend, no less, um, to be here. So I'm indebted and thank you. And if I am to believe what I read on the internet, this means that Adam has left his wife with three children, <laughs> a foster child, two poodles, one of whom is blind, and an angry cockatoo. Is that right? Yes, okay. So give it up for Adam Johnson, please. Greetings to everyone. Ooh, I just sounded rich in resonance, like um, James Earl Jones or something. Uh, ha can you hear me in the back? Thumbs up, okay? All right, wonderful. Um, I shouldn't get too close, that's too much, right? Okay, all right. Let me kind of lift. Me... How about I do that? It, there, this front row is open. If someone wants to come and sit in that front center seat, I will read directly to you tonight. Come on, Aspen. Uh, it's a great, great uh, pleasure to be here. It's great to see Adrian Bordeaux again. It's been many years. Um, and uh, what a wonderful place. Snow and, you know, hills and uh, wonderful. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, no, you have to take that one. Yeah. Can I ask your names? Jenny? Kelly, thank you, thank you. Um, I am gonna read a story tonight. I go to a lot of readings. Oh, Geraldine Brooks is coming. That's gonna be a treat. She's an amazing writer, so fantastic. I wish I was here for that. Uh, I go to a lot of events. I think, I don't know if people have lost the patience for readings or what, um, but I go to a lot that have just become like little expert excerpts and like then funny anecdotes. Um, but I like to just read, I like the oral connection to a story. And I'm going to read you a story tonight. Um, I'm going to read a short story called Nirvana. It's a fairly long story. In the collection there are six stories, you know, that span 300 pages, so they're all big. So I took this story, Nirvana, and I took out everything but the darkness and the sex. So if there are young people here, just, you know, be aware, there is going to be an adult encounter. So, um, and it's, uh, you may not have seen this one before. Oh. There's something going on in that corner of the room. But just remember that I warned them. Um, I, uh, I read this story once before and someone came up afterwards and said, oh, I really love that story. Um, but one question, who's that Kurt Cobain guy you were talking about? <laughs> I know it's been a few years. So will someone tell us who Kurt Cobain was? 
lead singer of Nirvana, and what happened to him? He took his life, that's right. Oh, you've been reading the websites I've been reading. Yeah. You know, in, I, I, I'm happy to take questions afterwards and talk about research. I research my stories a lot. And online, finding Kurt Cobain's suicide note um, was a really powerful, transformative thing. Um, but uh, anyway. Um, so C Kurt Cobain's in the story. And, oh, one other thing. You know, the Zika virus is in, on everyone's Facebook feed. And this terrible... Um, uh, microencephaly um, that people are enduring and encountering because of it. But the first um, awareness uh, that the Zika virus existed was an epidemic of Guillain-Barre syndrome, if you know what that is. If you don't, you're going to learn. <clears throat> it's late and I can't sleep. I raise a window for some spring Palo Alto air, but it doesn't help. In bed, eyes open, I hear whispers, which makes me think of the president because we often talk in whispers. I know the whispering sound is really just my wife, Charlotte, who listens to Nirvana on her headphones all night and tends to sleep mumble the lyrics. Charlotte has her own bed, a mechanical one. My sleep problem's this. When I close my eyes, I keep visualizing my wife killing herself, more like the way she might try to kill herself since she's paralyzed from the shoulders down. The paralysis is quite temporary, though try convincing Charlotte of that. She slept on her side today to fight the sores, and there was something about the way she stared at the bed's safety rail. The bed is voice-activated, so if she could somehow get her head between the bars of the safety rail... Incline is all she'd have to say. As the bed powered up, she'd be choked in seconds. But my wife doesn't need an exotic exit strategy, not when she's exacted a promise from me to help her do it when the time comes. I rise and I go to her. She's not listening to Nirvana yet. She saves it for when she needs it most, after midnight, when her nerves really start to crackle. I thought I heard a noise, I tell her, kind of a whisper. Short, choppy hair frames her drawn face, skin faint as refrigerator light. I heard it too, she says. Next to her voice remote is a half-smoked joint. I light it and I hold it to her lips. How's the weather in there, I ask her. Windy, she says. Windy is better than hail or lightning or God forbid flooding, which is the sensation she felt when her lungs were just starting to work again but there are different kinds of wind. I ask, windy like a whistle through window screens or windy like the rattle of storm shutters? A strong breeze, she says, hissy and buffeting like a microphone in the wind. Charlotte hates being stoned, but she says it quiets the inside of her. She has Guillain-Barre syndrome, a condition in which her immune system attacks the insulation around her nerves. When the brain sends signals to the body, the impulse is ground out before they can be received. A billion nerves inside her send signals that go everywhere and nowhere. This is the ninth month, a month at the edge of the medical literature. It's a place where the doctors no longer feel qualified to tell us whether Charlotte's nerves will begin to regenerate or whether she'll be stuck like this forever. She exhales, coughing. Her right arm twitches, which means her brain has failed at telling her arm to rise and cover her mouth. She tokes again. Through the smoke, she says, I'm worried. <laughs> what about you? You're worried about me. I want you to stop talking to the president, she says. It's time to accept reality. I try to be lighthearted. The president's the one who talks to me, I tell her. Then stop listening, she says. He's gone. When your time comes, you're supposed to fall silent. I nod, but she doesn't understand. Stuck in this bed... Having sworn off television, she's probably the only person in America who didn't see the assassination. If she'd beheld the look in the president's eyes when his life was taken, she'd understand why I talked to him late at night. If she could leave this room and feel the nation trying to grieve, she'd know why I reanimated the commander-in-chief and brought him back to life. 
Concerning my conversations with the president, I'd say, I'd just point out that you spent half your life listening to Nirvana, whose songs are by a guy who blew his brains out. Charlotte tilts her head and looks at me like I'm a stranger. Kurt Cobain took the pain of his life and made it into something that mattered. What did the president leave behind? Uncertainties, emptiness, a thousand rocks to overturn. She talks like this when she's stoned. I tap out the joint and I lift her headphones. Are you ready for your nirvana? I ask. She looks at the window. That sound, I hear it again, she says. At the window, I peer out into the darkness. It's a normal Palo Alto night. Blue recycling bins, a raccoon digging in the community garden. And then I notice it right before my eyes. A small black drone is hovering. Its tiny servos swivel to regard me. Real quick, I snatch the drone out of the air and I pull it inside. I close the window and I shut the curtains and then I study the thing. Its shell is made of black foil, stretched over tiny struts like the bones of a bat's wings. Behind a propeller of clear cellophane, a tiny infrared engine throbs with warmth. Now will you listen to me, Charlotte says. Now will you stop it with this president business? It's too late for that, I tell her, and I release the drone. As if blind, it bumbles around the room. Is it autonomous? Has someone been operating it? Someone watching our house? Play, music, Charlotte tells her voice remote. Closing her eyes, she waits for me to place the headphones on her ears where she will hear Kurt Cobain come to life once more. I wake later in the night. <clears throat> the drone has somehow turned itself on again and is hovering above me, mapping my body with a beam of red light. And then a green laser strikes my forehead. And I know the drone is attempting to determine my emotions. I toss a pillow over the thing, dropping it to the bed. And after making sure that Charlotte's asleep, I pull out my eye projector, turn it on, and the president appears in three dimensions, his torso life-sized in an amber glow. He greets me with a smile. It's good to be back in Palo Alto, the president says. You see, my algorithm has accessed the eye projector's GPS chip and searched the president's database for location references. This one came from a commencement address he gave at Stanford back when he was a senator. Mr. President, I say, I'm sorry to bother you again, but I have more questions. He looks into the distance, contemplative. Shoot, he says. I move into his line of sight, but I can't quite get him to look me in the eye. That's one of the design problems I ran across. Did I make a mistake in creating you, I ask him, in releasing you to the world? My wife says that you're keeping people from mourning, that this you keeps us from accepting the fact that the real you is gone. The president rubs the stubble on his chin. You can't put the genie back in the bottle, he says, which is eerie because that's a line he'd spoken on 60 minutes, a moment when he expressed regret for legalizing drones for civilian use. Do you know that I'm the one who made you? I ask him. We're all born free, the president says, and no person may traffic in another. But you weren't born, I tell him. I wrote an algorithm based on the Linux operating kernel. You're an open source search engine married to a dialogue bot and a video compiler. My program scrubs the web and archives a person's images and video and data. Everything you say, you've said before. For the first time, the president falls silent. I ask, do you know that you're gone, that, that you've died? The president doesn't hesitate. The end of life is another kind of freedom, he says, and the assassination flashes in my eyes. I've seen the video so many times. The motorcade slowly crawls along while the president, on foot, parades past the barricaded crowds. Someone in the throng catches the president's eye. The president turns, lifts a hand in greeting, and then the bullet strikes him in the abdomen. The impact bends him forward. His eyes lift to confront the shooter. A look of recognition settles into the president's gaze of a person, of a truth, of something he's foreseen. He takes the second shot in the face. You can see the switch go off. His limbs give and he is down. They put him on a machine for a few days, but the end had already come. I glance over at Charlotte, still asleep. Mr. President, I whisper, did you and the First Lady ever talk about the worst-case scenario? I wonder if 
The first lady was the one who turned off the machine. The president smiles. The first lady and I have a wonderful relationship. We share everything. But were there promises? Did you two make a deal? His voice lowers, becomes sonorous. Are you asking about the bonds of matrimony? I suppose so, I say. In this regard, he says, our only duty is to be of service in any way we can. And my mind ponders the ways in which I might have to be of service to Charlotte. Then the president looks into the distance like a flag's waving there. I'm the president of the United States, he says, and I approve this message. <laughs> That's when I know our conversation is over, but when I reach to turn off the eye projector, the president looks me squarely in the eye, a coincidence of perspective, I guess. My finger hesitates at the switch. Seek your inner resolve, he tells me. Can you tell a story that doesn't begin, it's just suddenly happening? The woman you love gets the flu. Her fingers tingle, her legs go rubbery. Soon she can't grip a coffee cup. What finally gets her to the hospital is the need to pee. She is dying to pee, but the paralysis has begun. The bladder could no longer hear the brain. After an ER doc inserts a Foley catheter, you learn new words, axon, abreflexia, ascending peripheral polyneuropathy. Charlotte says she's filled with noise. Inside her is a storm. The doctor gets a big needle. He tells Charlotte to climb on the gurney. Charlotte's scared to get on the gurney. She's scared she won't ever get up again. Please, honey, you say, get on the gurney. And soon you behold the glycerin glow of your wife's spinal fluid, and she is right. She doesn't get up again. Next comes plasmapheresis, then high-dose immunoglobulin therapy. The doctors mention casually the word ventilator. Charlotte's mother arrives. She brings her cello. She's an expert on the siege of Leningrad. She's written a book on the topic. When Charlotte's coma is induced, her mother fills the neuro ward with the saddest sounds ever conceived. For days, there's nothing but the swish of vent baffles, the trill of vital monitors, and Shostakovich, Shostakovich, Shostakovich. Two months of physical therapy in Santa Clara. Here are dunk tanks, sonar stimulators, exoskeletal treadmills. Charlotte doesn't make progress. The doctors don't call her a soldier or a champ or a trooper. She soon convinces herself that I will leave her for one of the nurses in the rehab ward. She screams at me to get a vasectomy, so this nurse and I will suffer a barren future. To soothe her, I read aloud Joseph Heller's memoir about contracting Guillaume Barre. The book was supposed to make us feel better. Instead, it chronicles how great Heller's friends are, how high Heller's spirits are, how Heller leaves his wife to marry the beautiful nurse who tends to him. And for Charlotte, the book's ending is particularly painful. Joseph Heller gets better. Finally, his discharge. Yet home is unexpectedly surreal. Amid familiar surroundings, the impossibility of normal life is amplified, but the cat's happy, so happy to have Charlotte home that it spends an entire night curled on her tracheal incision. Goodbye, cat. Still to be described are tests, tantrums, and treatments. To come are the discoveries of marijuana and Kurt Cobain. Of these times, there's only one moment I must relate. It was a normal night. I was beside Charlotte in her mechanical bed, holding up her People magazine. She said, you don't know how bad I want to get out of this bed. Her voice was quiet, uninflected. I'd do anything to escape, she said. I flipped the page and laughed at a picture whose caption read, stars are just like us but I could never do that to you, she said. Do what, I asked. Nothing. What are you talking about? What's going through your head? I turned to look at her, except for how it would hurt you. I would get away. But get away where? From here. Neither of us had spoken of the promise since the night it was exacted. I tried to pretend the promise didn't exist, but it existed. Face it, you're stuck with me, I said, forcing a smile. We're fated to be together, and soon you'll be better, and things will be normal again, and my entire life is this pillow. Well, that's not true, I said. You've got your friends and family, and you've got technology. The whole world's at your fingertips. My friends, I meant her nurses and physical therapists. By family, I meant her distant and brooding mother. It didn't matter. Charlotte was too disengaged to even point out her non-functional fingers and their non-feeling tips. 
She rolled her head and stared at that safety rail. It's okay, she said. I'd never do that to you. In the morning, I massage Charlotte's legs and feet. It's our routine. Let's wake up, I tell her toes. It's time to start dancing. Look who's Mr. Brightside, she says. You must have been talking to the president. Isn't that why you talk to him to get all inspired? I rub her Achilles tendon. Last week, Charlotte failed a big test, the DTRE, which measures deep tendon response and signals the beginning of recovery. Don't worry, the doctor told us. I know of another patient who also took nine months to respond, and he managed a full recovery. I asked if we could contact this patient to know what he went through to help us see what's ahead. The doctor informed us that this patient was attended to in France in the year 1918. <laughs> After the doctor left, I went into the garage and I started making the president. The psychologist would probably say the reason I created him had to do with the promise I made Charlotte and the fact that the president also had a relationship with the person who took his life. But it's simpler than that. I just needed to save somebody. And with the president, it didn't matter that I was too late. I tap Charlotte's patella, but there's no response. Any pain, I ask her. So what did the president say? I articulate the plantar fascia. How about this? I saw the eye projector, she says. I know you talked to him. It's going to be one of her bad days. Let me guess, Charlotte says. The president told you to move to the South Pacific and take up painting. That's inspiring, isn't it? I don't say anything. You'd take me with you, right, she asks. I could be your assistant. I could hold your paint palette in my teeth. If you need a model, I specialize in reclining nudes. If you must know, I tell her, the president told me to locate my inner resolve. Inner resolve, she says. I could use some help tracking down mine. You have more resolve than anyone I know, I tell her. Jesus, you're sunny. Don't you know what's going on? Don't you see that I'm about to spend the rest of my life like this? Pace yourself, darling, I say. The day is only a couple minutes old. I know, I know, she says. I'm supposed to have reached a stage of enlightened acceptance or something. You think I'd like it that the only person I have to get mad at is you? I know it's not right. You're the one person I love in this world. Well, you love Kurt Cobain. He's dead, she says. Promise me something. <laughs> no, I tell her. Come on, if you do, I'll release you from the other promise. I shake my head. She will never release me. She says, just agree to talk straight with me. You don't have to be fake and optimistic. It doesn't help. I am optimistic. Well, you shouldn't be. Pretending, that's what killed Kurt Cobain. I think it was the shotgun he pointed at his head. But I don't say that. I only know one line from Nirvana. I karaoke it to Charlotte. With the lights on, I sing. She's less dangerous. She rolls her eyes. You got it wrong, she says, but she smiles. I try to encourage this. What, I don't get points for trying? You don't hear that, Charlotte says. Hear what, I ask. That's the sound of me clapping, she says. I give up, I say. Bed, incline, Charlotte says. It's time for her to start her day. In the garage, I decide to get to the bottom of this drone business. I docked the drone to a bank of servers and used some slave code to parse its drive. I burned through its firewall, and then I reinitialized. It turns out the little guy speaks Google, so I sync it to a pair of Android glasses. I install a new OS, reboot, and like that, the drone is mine. Wearing the clear glasses, I roll my eyes, and the drone, lithe and liquid, does a backflip. Inside the house, I find Charlotte suspended in a sling from the Hoyer lift, which has been rolled to the window so she can see outside. I go to her, and I open the window. You read my mind, she says, and she breathes fresh air. I put the glasses on her, and it takes her eyes a minute of flashing around before the drone lifts from my hands. A grand smile crosses her face as she puts it through its paces hovering, rotating, swiveling the camera servos, and then the drone is off. Out the window, we watch it cross the lawn, veer around the compost piles, and head for the community garden. When she makes it to her plot, she gasps. My roses, she says, they're still there. Someone's been taking care of them. 
I wouldn't let your roses die, I tell her. She has the drone, inspect every bloom. Carefully, she maneuvers it through the bright petals, brushing against the blossoms, and then she shuttles it home again. Suddenly, it's hovering before us, and Charlotte sniffs the drone. I never thought I'd smell my roses again, she says, her face flush with hope and amazement, and the tears begin streaming. I remove her glasses, and we leave the drone hovering there. She regards me. I want to have a baby, she says. A baby? It's been nine months. I could have had one already. I could have been doing something useful this whole time. But, but your illness, I say, we do not know what's ahead. She closes her eyes like she's hugging something, like she's holding some dear truth. With a baby, I'd have something to show for all this. I'd have a reason. At the least, I'd have something to leave behind. You can't talk like that, I tell her. We have talked about you not talking like this. But she won't listen to me. She won't even open her eyes. All she says is, and I want to start tonight. <clears throat> Later, I carry the eye projector out back into the gardening shed. Here in the gold of afternoon light, the president rises and comes to life. Mr. President, I say, I'm sorry to bother you again. Nonsense, he tells me. I serve at the pleasure of the people. Do you even remember me, I ask him? Do you remember the problems I've been talking to you about? Perennial is the nature of the problems that plague man. Particular is the voice with which they call to each of us. My problem today is of a personal nature, I say. Then I place this conversation under the seal. I haven't made love to my wife in a long time. He holds up a hand to halt me. He smiles in a knowing, fatherly way. Times of doubt, he tells me, are inherent in the compact of civil union. My question's about children. Would you still have brought yours into the world knowing that only one of you might be around to raise them? <laughs> Single parenting places too much strain on today's families, he says. That's why I'm introducing legislation that will reduce the burden on our hardworking parents. But what about your children? Do you miss them? My mind goes to them constantly. Being away is the great sacrifice of the office. In the shed, suspended dust makes a specter glitter and swirl. When it's finally over, I ask him, where is it that we go? Well, I'm no preacher, the president says, but I believe we go where we are called. But where were you called to? Where is it that you are? <laughs> don't we all try to locate ourselves among the pillars of uncommon knowledge? You don't know where you are, do you? I ask the president. I'm sure my opponent would like you to believe that. <laughs> it's okay, I say, more to myself than anything. I didn't expect you to know. Well, I know exactly where I am, the president says. And then, in a voice that sounds pieced from many scraps, he adds, I'm currently positioned at 37.44 north by 122.14 west. I think he's done. I wait for him to say good night and God bless America. Instead, he reaches out and touches my chest. I have heard that you have made much personal sacrifice, he says, and I'm told that your sense of duty is strong. I don't think I agree, but I say, yes, sir. His glowing hand then clasps my shoulder, and it doesn't matter that I can't feel it. Then this metal that I have fixed to your uniform is much more than a piece of silver. It is a symbol of how much you have given, not just in armed struggle and not just in service to your nation. It marks you forever as one who can be counted upon, as one who in times of need will lift up and carry those who have fallen. Proudly, he stares into the empty space above my shoulder. He says, now return home to your wife, soldier, and start a new chapter in life. When darkness falls, I go to Charlotte. The night nurse has placed her in a negligee. Charlotte lowers the bed as I approach. The electric motor is the only sound in the room. I'm ovulating, she announces. I can feel it. You can feel it? I don't need to feel it, she says. I know. She's strangely calm. Are you ready, she asks. Sure, I say. I steady myself on the safety rail that separates us. She asks, do you want some oral sex first? I shake my head. Come join me then, she says. I start to climb into the bed, but she stops me. Hey, sunshine, she says, take off your clothes. 
I can't remember the last time she called me that. Oh yeah, I say, and I unbutton my shirt, and I unzip my jeans. When I drop my underwear, I feel weirdly naked. I swing a leg up, and then I kind of lie on her. A look of contentment crosses her face. This is how it's supposed to be, she says. It's been a long time since I've looked into your eyes. Her body is narrow, but warm. I don't know where to put my hands. Do you want to pull down my panties, she asks. I sit up and I begin to work them off. I see the scar from the femoral stent. When I heft her legs, there are the bed sores we've been fighting. Remember our trip to Mexico, she asks, when we made love on the top of that pyramid? It was like we were in the past and the future at the same time. I kind of feel that now. You're not stoned, are you? I ask her. What? Like I'd have to be stoned to recall the first time we talked about having a baby? When I have her panties off and her legs hooked, I pause. It takes all of my focus to get an erection, and then I can't believe that I have one. Here's my wife, paralyzed, invalid, insensate, and though everything's the opposite of erotic, I am poised above her completely hard. I'm wet, aren't I? Charlotte asks. I've been thinking about this all day. I do remember that pyramid. The stone was cold, the staircase steep. The past to me was a week of Charlotte under Mayan dresses, cooing at every baby she came across, having sex under jungle stars. I tried to imagine our future, a faceless someone conceived on a sacrificial altar. I finished early and tried to shake it off. I focused only on those steps we had to make it down in the dark. I think I feel something, she says. You're inside me, right? Because I'm pretty sure I can feel it. Here's where I enter my wife and begin our lovemaking. I try to focus on the notion that if this works, Charlotte will be safe, that for nine months she'd let no harm come to her. And maybe she's right. Maybe the baby will stimulate something and recovery will begin. Charlotte smiles. It's brittle, but it's a smile. How's this for finding the silver lining, she says. I won't have to feel the pain of childbirth. This makes me wonder if a paralyzed woman can push out a baby, or does she get the scalpel? And if so, is there anesthesia? And suddenly my body is at the edge of not cooperating. <laughs> hey, are you here, she asks. I'm trying to get you to smile. I just need to focus, I tell her. I can tell you're not really into this, she says. I can tell you're still hung up on the idea that I'm going to do something drastic to myself. Just because I talk about crazy stuff doesn't mean that I'm going to do anything. I say, then why would you promise? Make me promise to help you do it. The promise came early, in the beginning, just before the ventilator. She had a vomiting reflex that lasted for hours. Imagine endless dry heaves while you're paralyzed. The doctors finally gave her narcotics, drugged, dead-limbed, and vomiting. That's when it hit her that her body was no longer hers. I was holding her hair, keeping it out of the basin. She was panting between heaves. She said, promise me that when I tell you to make it stop, you'll make it stop. <laughs> make what stop, I asked. She retched, long and cord rattling. I knew what she was talking about. It won't come to that, I said. She tried to say something, but retched again. I promise. I said to her, and now, in her mechanical bed, her negligee strap slipping off her shoulders, Charlotte says, it's hard for you to understand, I know, but the idea that there's a way out, it's what allows me to keep going. I'd never take it. You believe me, don't you? I hate that promise. I hate that you made me make it. I'd never do it, and I'd never make you help. Then release me, I tell her. I can't, she says. I decided to just shut it all out and keep going. I'm losing my erection, and my mind wonders what will happen if I go soft. Do I have it in me to fake it? I shut it out, and I keep going and going, pounding on Charlotte until I can barely feel anything. Her breasts loll alone below me, and from the bedside table, the drone turns itself on and rises, hovering. It flashes my forehead with its laser, as if what I'm feeling is that easy to determine, as if my emotion has a name. Is the thing spying on me, feeling sympathy or executing old code? I wonder if the drone's OS reverted to a previous version or if Google reacquired it or if it's in some kind of autonomous mode. Or could it be that someone hacked the Android glasses? Or maybe that's when I look down and see that Charlotte is crying. I stop. No, don't, she says. Keep going. She's not crying hard, but they're fat, lamenting tears. We can try again tomorrow, I tell her. No. I'm okay, she says, just keep going, 
and do something for me, would you? All right, put the headphones on me. You mean while we're doing it? Music on, she says. From the headphones on her bedside table, Nirvana starts to hum. I know I'm doing it all wrong. I say, it's been a long time. And it's not you, she says. I just need my music. Just put the headphones on me. Why do you need Nirvana? What is it to you? She closes her eyes and shakes her head. What is it with Kurt Cobain? I say, what's your deal with him? I grab her wrists and pin them, but she can't feel it. Why do you have to have this music? What is wrong with you, I demand. Just tell me what it is that's wrong with you. The drone follows me to the garage, where it wanders the walls looking for a way out. I turn on a computer, and I download one of these Nirvana albums. I play the whole thing just sitting there in the dark. This guy, this Kurt Cobain, sings about being stupid and dumb and unwanted. In one song, he says Jesus doesn't want him for a sunbeam. Another's called All Apologies, but he never actually apologizes. He doesn't even say what he did wrong. And the drone having found no escape, comes to me and hovers. I lift the remote for the garage door opener. Is this what you want, I ask it, freedom? The drone silently hums a passive atop a column of warm air. I press the button. The drone waits until the garage door is all the way up, and then it snaps a photograph of me and zooms off into the Palo Alto night. I stand... And I breathe the air, which is flowered. Moonlight casts leaf patterns on the driveway. Down the street, I spot the glowing eyes of our cat. I call his name, but he doesn't come. I gave him to a friend a couple blocks away, and for a few weeks, the cat returned at night to visit me. Not anymore. This feeling of being in proximity to something that's lost to you, it seems like my whole life right now. It's a feeling Charlotte would understand if she would just talk to the president. But she's not the one he needs, she needs to speak to. I suddenly understand that. I return to my computer bench, and I fire up a bank of screens. I stare into their blue glow, and I get to work. It takes me hours, most of the night, before I'm done. It's almost dawn when I go to Charlotte. The room is dark, and I can only see her outline. Bed, incline, I say, and she starts to rise. She wakes and stares at me, but says nothing. Her face is that lack of expression you get after you've been through all the emotions. I set the eye projector on her lap. She hates it, but says nothing. She only tilts her head a little, like she is sad for me, and then I turn it on. Kurt Cobain appears before her, clad in a bathrobe and composed of soft blue light. Charlotte inhales. Oh my God, she murmurs. She looks at him. She looks at me. Is it him? I nod. She marvels at him. What do I say, she asks. Can he talk? I don't answer. Kurt Cobain's hair is in his face. Shifting her gaze a little, Charlotte tries to look into his eyes. While the president couldn't quite find your eyes, Kurt is purposefully avoiding them. I can't believe how young you are, Charlotte tells him. You're just a boy. Kurt mumbles, I'm old. Are you really here, she asks. Here we are now, he sings. Entertain us. His voice is rough and hard-lived. It's some kind of proof of life to Charlotte. She looks at me, filled with wonder. I thought he was gone, she says. I can't believe he's really here. Kurt shrugs. I only appreciate things when they're gone, she sa he says. And Charlotte looks stricken. I recognize that line, she says to me. That's a line from his suicide note. How does he know that? Has he already written it? Does he know what he's about to do? I don't know, I tell her. This isn't my conversation to have. I back away toward the door, and just as I'm leaving, I hear her start talking to him. Don't do what you're thinking about doing, she pleads with him. You don't know how special you are. You don't know how much you matter to me, she says carefully, like she's talking to a child. Please don't take yourself from me. You can't do that to me, she says, and she leans a little toward Kurt Cobain, like she wants to throw her arms around him and hold him, like she's forgotten that her arms don't work and there is no him to embrace. It wasn't that bad. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you for listening to that weird story. It's a pretty weird one. Um, but I think we have like 15 minutes, 20 minutes. I'd love to, people are curious about uh, riders, like what kind of weird animals they are. Uh, I also get a lot of questions about um, North Korea, what it's like to go there and write about this place. No one's ever asked me if Hel uh, Joseph Heller really wrote a memoir about Guillaume Barre and left his wife with a beautiful nurse. You can ask whatever you want. The other night someone asked me, <laughs> the other night someone asked me if it was really true that Kim Jong-il's sushi chef, Kenji Fujimoto, used to get naked with him every night after the banquets and go into the sauna where Fujimoto was forced to kiss the naked Kim Jong-il 100 times. But that's, a, that's an esoteric question. I probably won't get that one. <clears throat> Thanks for coming to Aspen. Um, my question for you is, what do you think the value of storytelling is, and if you encourage your family um, to be storytellers as well? That's a great question. Man, I've come to the right town. Um, what is the value of storytelling? I mean, it is who we are. It is what we are made of. It is like the air we breathe. Narrative is every single thing about us, and it's so totally us, we're not even aware of it. But when, let's say, uh, you have a dream, it's kind of a nebulous thing, but you get up and you tell the person you care about over breakfast, breakfast this dream you have. But when you tell it, you have to turn it into a story. And a narrative is our most essential meaning-making machine as human beings. When you start a narrative, it must come up with something. It often comes up with something that scares us or surprises us. Even me, I don't know what they're going to be about. But when you take that dream and you say it, suddenly you have to give voice to it, right? You have to assume a central role in the dream. You have to choose perspective, point of view, point of narration, right? You must um, put it in time. Though a dream is outside of time, you must give it chronology, you must give it causality. That great cascade of plot begins with causality. You must pick entry and exit points, the structure, the architecture. A story works on like 20 different, just technical levels of meaning to us. We are stuck in time and exist in time and exist in perspective. And any time you tell a story, you're engaging the full human faculties of the person who's listening. My wife's a writer, so we talk about stories all the time. Oh, I, I can see this guy. He's going to ask the, the nude sauna question. <laughs> Actually, this is, a, uh, this is a book club question. Sure, wonderful. Um, how does the, uh, the title of the book, Fortune Smiles, relate to the first five stories, if at all? Ooh, huh. Okay, I got 10 minutes. Um, uh, that's a, I don't know. I, you know, I, there's another story in the book that was very personal to me. That book, Fortune Smiles, uh, I was going to write a big nonfiction piece. And I must say that I wrote this novel, The Orphan Master's Son, which was a very powerful and personal book to write because I took the stories of so many North Koreans and defectors, people who weren't allowed to tell their stories, and even in freedom, like, kind of were not able to. I think, like... There's a, there's a lag between like wars and war literature. And I think there's gonna be a lag between people who've made it out of North Korea and the finding voice and artistic means to express that. I can talk about 10 different reasons why North Koreans have a hard time telling their stories. Um, but that was mostly a book based on research. Um, a lot of the, the stories in the collection are very personal, like this one. Um, and uh, there's another story in the collection that's also very personal. It's about my wife getting cancer. It's called Interesting Facts. And the book was called that. And um, I just wanted to point to the, the very personal nature of the book. Um, but other people just were honest with me. They said, that's kind of cold, interesting facts. Just those kind of high sounds and there's something clinical about that. And people were like, you know, fortune smiles. Just in the mouth, it has a warmth to it. And... Um, and so that story, I don't know. Uh, that's just the title. You know, there are people, you just write the stories and then other people figure out how to sell them. And uh, my friends and my publisher were like, go with that title. I said, okay. Um, 
But you know, that story, Fortune Smiles, uh, I was fortunate enough to get to interview uh, a North Korean defector named Park sang hak He's the guy who floats all the balloons over North Korea. And uh, another one named Jan Jin Sung, who's the, who we just, you know, we found two North Koreans who were secretly riding and smuggled their works out. One is still in North Korea. He just smuggled his work out in his state. His name is Bandy. You can look him up. But Jan Jin Sung is the only person who smuggled his, his poetry out of North Korea. And after interviewing these guys, uh, you know, I really wanted to create this portrait of what it was like for them. Um, in The Orphan Master's Son, I think I inadvertently suggested that all you had to do was get out of North Korea and your life was going to be great. Though I know from meeting and reading the stories of many defectors that that was not the case, and they struggled, even the elites. And so Park sang Hawk, you know, I interviewed him. He was so generous, endlessly, about his life in North Korea. And, you know, I know we only got a few minutes, but if you think of, like, Kim Jong-un, the dear leader, we think of him as an omnipotent dictator, but he's really riding atop a three-headed hydra that's trying to kill him at every moment, you know? Um, you know, the KPA would, uh, the Korean People's Army would love to overthrow him and rule like a junta in Burma, you know? Um, the, the army, the party, and then there's this third group, and they're always trying to kill him. They tried to kill his dad like five times. The other group are the elites of Pyongyang. And you have to think of the elites of Pyongyang as being like, uh, like the Sopranos. There's probably like 3,000 families, and they're all mob families, and they run this very powerful clique. And what they must do, and both these gentlemen were in this group, what they must do is deliver a certain amount of hard currency to the regime every month. Because the yuan, the North Korean yuan, is not valued on the world market. They cannot buy rocket parts or champagne. And they make nothing. They only really export raw materials to China, you know, timber and minerals. But what they do is they have criminal organizations. Uh, they're the number one meth producers in that uh, region of the world. Heroin, they're the biggest heroin producers of that area. Um, they're the best counterfeiters on the face of the earth. In fact, the only reason the United States changed its $100 bill is because the North Koreans mastered it to the point we couldn't tell the difference. So we had to change our currency. So Park sang Hak had to deliver a certain amount of money to the Kim regime every month. And uh, what he had to do was run a, a, a Japanese car stealing organization that stole between 800 and 1,000 cars out of Japan. They shipped them on the ferry from Nagata to Vladivostok, trained them down from China to Chongjin, where they cut the catalytic converters out, which are filled with palladium and platinum and worth a lot, each one. And they, very, in a very sophisticated way, rolled the uh, odometers back and dumped them cheap in China. And so um, he had to make a certain amount of money uh, every month and, and hand it over. He was in big trouble. Um, it's like what his life was like. And this is a guy with uh, a Mercedes Benz and a driver. And when he escaped, he didn't like, escape, escape. He had his driver drive him to China, which meant that his driver unwittingly defected as well. And uh, the story of someone who is brought out of North Korea against his will uh, was an interesting one. I guess I'm just rambling. <laughs> For the people in, in the room, what do you think all these elites who make all this money and turn it over to Kim, together they're very powerful and he has to court their approval all the time. Um, what do you think they want for all that money? What would you want? They can't have that. A hundred kisses. Who doesn't want that? What's that? No, there's no security there. Okay, you're good. They're kids. I heard that. The number one desire is that their kids are educated overseas. So that they're not indoctrinated, that they're educated. The number two thing they want is travel. And they do get junkets. And these are people who have secretly gone to Japan and Beijing, but they always have to leave family members behind to be held as hostage. No one ever goes as a group. Um, and they want goodies, material goods, you know. Um, and when I went to North Korea, which was in 2007, you didn't see 
any cell phones there. You didn't see any iPads. But I talk to people who go there all the time, and now people are wearing Gucci, and they have handbags, and they have their Samsungs. And uh, um, how many cell phones do you think are in North Korea? Ten? <laughs> Ten thousand? The only, North Korea doesn't report anything about it. Uh, the only reason we know is because they can't make their own cell phone tower network. So an Egyptian company, Oriscom, has made it for them. And they're publicly traded and they have to report that there's over three million cell phones in North Korea. And so if you look at the population of Pyongyang, which we don't know exactly, but it's probably the same subscription rate that we have in Americans, like the same number of people have smartphones there. Um, of course, you know, there's three different tiers and three networks, and only the only elites will get the 3G international calling. It's a very small amount, but well, their lives are you know similar in certain ways. And you know, when you talk to the defectors, their lives are very different than ours. But one thing that always amazes me is that they is how much we have in common. You know, they they want safety, security, a better future for their kids, the stability of life, opportunity self-determination, like all, it really strikes me. You think, oh, they've seen all these things we will never see. We have so much that divides us, but um, they're just like us. Okay, we've got a couple more minutes. Another question? Um, Listen, sorry, that's the microphone. I, 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 yeah. um, in the Orphan Master Son, I thought it was so inventive the way you use the broadcasting to sort of take over the narrative voice and come in. Um, with the story and and just take it to another level of sort of parody almost and I wondered just wondering when, when in your creative process Writing the book that came, you came up with that and when you decided to really go with that. Yeah, um, thank you You know um, I could talk about North Korea forever. I just have endless anecdotes that uh, obsessively fascinate me um, but you know I started reading about North Korea just like in 2004, and I was just curious, um, I read a memoir of someone who'd been in a gulag there, and I really was embarrassed to realize that I didn't know that much about Korea or North Korea. I have Korean and Korean American students and colleagues at Stanford, and I've kind of realized I was pretty ignorant. I didn't know anything about the Korean War, honestly, beyond just the basics, and I, I really didn't know those. Like, we made a, a television show called MASH, which was really about martinis, wasn't it? Uh, that's about all I knew. And so, like, for a year, I, was, I just tried to read about North Korea and Korean history. And just what I wanted to know was, like, what was it like to be an English teacher there, which is what I am, or a dad, or what do you eat for breakfast, or how do you find the person you love, you know? Um, and it turned out those things weren't really in books. Um, they, most of the books were about economics and military and political issues. And about, like, after a year of just kind of reading and reading, just as a curious reader, I discovered two things that kind of turned me into a writer. One is that all the stories I wanted weren't in books. They were on the web. And there was, like, a whole, an explosion of them. And for many reasons, NGO workers, aid workers, Christian missionaries uh, were putting all these field narratives that they'd acquired out there and just reading these unadulterated stories of people saying what their lives were like moved me in a way I just didn't know what to do with. Like, when people give you stories like that, they, it's just it's like a stone in you. And you have to carry it until you do something with it. Then meeting my first person from North Korea was very powerful. He'd been an orphan, and all I knew about my book was that my character was going to have a similar experience. Um, and then a funny thing happened. I started reading North Korean propaganda. And I was like, they have a very interesting story they tell about themselves. And they're really interested in promulgating their notions to the world. And y y if you want some homework, go to a North Korean website. Um, uh, they have all the works of Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung downloadable for free in PDF form to your Kindle in all the languages of the world. And I mean Swahili and Icelandic. Um, they seem so mysterious, but you know, their main newspaper is the Rodong Shinmun, which means the Workers' Party paper, and it's put out every day, and they translate it into English for us. Their AP wire is the kcna.co.jp, and um, it's like all the stories of North Korea are there for you to read. They're all lies, of course, but it's their, it's their version of themselves, and that was very important to me. Um, 
If you see these pictures in the newspaper of like Kim Jong-un like inspecting a factory or sitting alone on a ski lift by himself, um, do you know that those come from his blog? Kim Jong-un has a blog called The Supreme Leader's Daily Activities, and it's a photo <laughs> blog. It's R-O-D-O-N-G, Rodong Shinmun, S-H-I-N-M-U-N, just like it sounds, you know. And um, I started reading the stories they told about themselves. And what I realized is like they had a narrative that was relatively unquestioned, that was a national narrative. And it made me think about the narrative we have, that we've absorbed our whole lives, that I had honestly, like as, a, as like an English professor, was so a part of me I'd never questioned it. And I remember the first newspaper I read, and I, I, like for 10 years I got up and read the news out of North Korea before I read the, you know, the Times. Um, the first issue I read, it was a story about uh, a, a flock of doves had uh, uh, circled above Kim Jong-il walking through Pyongyang to give him shade. The front page news. And so I was like, oh, that's the world they live in. That's news. And what, when Kim jong Kim Jong-il seems is alive to me because he's in my book, so he's forever alive. When Kim Jong-il walks past flowers, what happens? They wilt. Oh, to the camps. <laughs> to the camps with her. What happens? They bloom. They blossom. And when Kim Jong-un walks past snow, it melts. That's right. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean... Our narrative is very simple, I can tell you in just one minute. It's so simple. It is the essence of every book we read and every movie we see and how we're supposed to shape our own lives. And the Western narrative goes like this. Each one of us is special. That's a pretty big premise. <laughs> Do you believe it? Like your life is about you. Come on, you love that guy. He gave you his coat, but it's about you, right? Yeah. How is it that each of our lives is about us? How does that happen with 300 million people? It's bizarre. But every one of us is special and valuable and unique. And what our job in life to do is to imagine our best possible future self and try to become that person. And so there is uh, imagination at work. It's based on plumbing your internal desires and yearnings, right? manufacturing this future, and this is very important when it comes to North Korea, picking the path that you think will lead to it, whether it's school or the military or whatever, and so you wanna be an artist or a, a rich banker or a homemaker, you imagine this self and you set out on a life path to get there. You encounter conflict, or you have to deal with it. There are obstacles, you must overcome them. You must look inward, you must look to history, you must enlist the help of others, and as you climb this mountain where you are at top a better you and you're gonna go up there and meet that you and you fight and you struggle you define yourself because your yearnings uh, turn to choices turn to actions which start a cascade of reaction that's what we call plot right that comes from inside character and you get up there and it doesn't matter if the you you wanted is up there it really doesn't because at the top of the mountain you've grown you've changed there's insight and wisdom and discovery the North Korean story is just the opposite. <laughs> There's one central character in their national narrative, and who is it? And there are 23 million secondary characters. And their job is to say, great idea, Kim. You've done it again, Kim. Right? And what they want out of life is actually a hindrance to survival. The defectors talk about when their kids, people from Pyongyang or their province capitals coming into their schools to ascertain their aptitudes for certain things, and they say, you're going to be a dentist, ballerina, fisherman, sorry. I hope you like the smell of fish. And that is that, okay? And aside from your seven years of mandatory military service, your course is set and you're never going to change. And they're taught not to look inward and not to imagine the future, and not to dwell on the past, that's a hindrance to survival. You must make your work quotas. You must get your calories every day. And so there, there's a choice that's inherent between surviving and living. We define living as a free and meaningful life. There you can't have both. 
And that's what I wanted to put really central to my book. My character does turn out to live a meaningful life. All he has to do is die, you know? And that was a pretty simple bargain for, for my character and the orphan master's son. And so they go about their lives as secondary characters, you know? And then when they get out, they're like, whoa, the way we think is very bizarre to them. And it's also difficult for us to try to imagine what life might be like for them. Here's one thing. After Kim Jong-il died, there were all those waves of people weeping in mass that you saw on TV. It was a cold January when Kim Jong-il's funeral was there. I was asked hundreds of times, were those people really crying or were they faking it? Right? What a Western question. Where we live in a land of choice. I believe that's true or that's a lie. I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat. Where you get to decide your own reality and everything that comes with it. In North Korea, the truth and the lie are folded in a way that's difficult for us to imagine. They're one in a way that we force separation from. And here's one, here's one proof of that. When you go to North Korea, um, I mentioned like, um, you know, flowers blossoming um, before Kim Jong-il. Another thing that happens there, nature tends to ratify the regime in many ways. One thing that happens there is spontaneous bark curving. What this means is that trees, usually at night, will really just fall in love with the deer leader or really approve of something that the deer leader's done and carve a slogan in Hangul in their bark at night. And then, like, so when you go to North Korea, they will take you to these things and they'll say, huh, come on, <laughs> come on. Look at the, the spruce. Look at the spruce. And you're like, whoa, wow. Um, and so... There was this really interesting thing when Kim Jong-il died, that not, uh, the night before the funeral, some trees in the middle of winter in Pyongyang did bark carving. And uh, they lamented and grieved his passing and what a great leader he'd been. And so thousands of people were led to these trees, and we saw the footage of them kneeling down and weeping and just bowing before the truth, that the trees were right. It's so... No human on earth could believe that a tree can carve itself. They're just as smart as we are. They're not stupid. They know this is wrong. They know that some dude had to go out there and carve this at night. They know it, right? But it must be true, right? And they kneel down and they're like, oh, wow. And so the truth and the lie for them, what, why waste effort trying to separate them? Right? It's their whole lives. or them, And then when they get out, they're conjoined in a way that we have to try to understand them by wrapping our head around their large abstractions. And trust me, our abstractions, like freedom, are baffling to them. That they're at the center. That they have to decide everything. But I I'll probably should stop there. <laughs> Is it time? Okay. <laughs> <laughs>